Hello, my ambitious friends. It's me, Claire, and I'm happy that you're here to steal my art. This is part one of my step-by-step -step tutorial on how to forge my painting, Lucrezia Claro. This is the first of six lessons for this art forgery project. These lessons are part of the curriculum at the unaccredited College of Clare. You'll be able to access the additional videos at the unaccredited College of Clare, which you can find on patreon.com slash Clare Lockhart. Double check the spelling. It's K-L-A-I-R-E-L-O-C-K-H-E-A-R-T. In part one, I'm going to show you how to grid, draw, and cover lines. Before you get to work, I'd like to share the beginning and end points of part one. You'll start with a blank 20 by 30 inch vertical canvas. After you work through all the steps of part one, you'll have a pencil outline portrait of Lucrezia Claro that will be ready for painting when you get to step two. Throughout this lesson, I'm going to switch back and forth between videos and photographs. The videos will show you all the steps I took while creating the original painting. The photos will allow me to break down the steps into smaller, more manageable pieces. Creating art is hard, and making an oil portrait can be pretty difficult. I don't want you to get overwhelmed, and that's why I am going to break down these steps into much smaller, more manageable chunks. I don't want you to feel overwhelmed, and I want you to feel successful with the progress that you make in each part of the process. Your first step is to create a grid on your canvas. To make this grid, you'll need the following materials, beginning with your 30 by 20 inch gessoed canvas. Now I build my own stretchers, so if you want to make a very convincing forgery, you'll build yours so it is 20 inches wide, 30 inches tall, and 1.75 inches deep. If you don't have access to woodworking equipment, it's completely okay to buy a pre-manufactured canvas. However, it is absolutely imperative that you get the correct size. It has to be 30 by 20 inches. Otherwise, your proportions will be thrown off and your picture will look not good. It'll be like if you've ever gone to a hotel and turned on the TV and all the actors are stretched out and skewed in really weird ways. It's because the aspect ratio is incorrect. So please do not substitute a different size canvas. I know 16 by 20 inch canvases are much more readily available, but the problem with swapping out a different size with, for example, that 16 by 20, that's a four to five ratio. Whereas the one you need is a two to three ratio and those numbers don't match. I know I went on a little bit longer of a tangent than I needed to, but I have seen people try to change the size of their canvas and it doesn't match with their reference image. And you're using the original painting that I created and it is 20 by 30 inches. And so the way to create the most successful painting is to have the right size canvas. In addition to having your 20 by 30 inch canvas, you'll also need painter's tape, a pencil and eraser. You need a ruler and I recommend having a yardstick or a long straight edge. And finally, you'll need your reference photo. The reference photo is a five inch wide by seven and a half inch copy of my painting Lucrezia Claro. And the reason it is that size is because it lines up perfectly with the 20 by 30 inch canvas. Five inches goes into 20 four times. Seven and a half goes into 30 four times. This means you're going to quadruple the size of your reference image to your canvas. <sighs> Is anyone else really tired of the stereotype that artists are bad at math? Yeesh.
Before you start drawing, I highly recommend that you tape the edges of your canvas. You can use painter's tape to keep the edges clean, but masking tape is also acceptable. I'm telling you to do this now because it will save you a lot of time at the end and you won't have to clean up any fingerprints or paint drips. You want to have clean white edges if you are going to hang your artwork in contemporary galleries. You'll notice that a lot of these spaces have pristine white walls. And if you have clean white edges on your unframed artwork, it doesn't cause a distraction that takes away from the awesome painting that you are about to make. To begin your grid, you'll measure every four inches along the top edge. Mark every four inches along the bottom too. Don't rotate your canvas because it may not be exactly 20 inches, which is why you should start the measurements both on the left side. Make a mark at four inch increments along the left side beginning at the top. There will be a two inch section at the bottom since 30 isn't divisible by four. When marking the right side, remember to start the measurements at the top as well. Use a yardstick or a long straight edge to connect all the vertical lines. Just match up the two measurements and then make the line. Draw very softly so it will be easier to erase these lines later. Connect all the horizontal lines too using a yardstick and make sure your lines are straight. After drawing the main grid, you'll subdivide the more complex areas, which includes the face. It's a really good idea to label the grid so you won't get lost when you're drawing. Please be very careful that you're making the smaller squares in the exact right locations. You'll notice that I used the computer when I did my drawing, but that's because I was just looking for lines. However, I highly recommend that you print your reference photo before you start painting. Really make sure that you create these smaller squares in the right spots and don't press too hard because it could dent the canvas. Ultimately, you will draw a four inch square grid across the entire surface of your canvas. This will make drawing the actual portrait a lot easier. I'm going to go through all these steps nice and slow. When I teach in person, I typically will do one step at a time, pause, wait for everyone to finish that step and then move on. You can reenact this process on your own simply by watching a step, pausing the video, completing it, and then resuming the video when you're ready to do the next step. The reason I'm going very slow is I want to make sure that your measurements are accurate. So you'll start by measuring the top of your canvas and you're going to align your ruler with the top left corner. From there, you're going to make a mark every four inches across the top edge of your canvas. Your measurements will be at four inches, eight, 12, and 16. Now the odds that your canvas is exactly 20 inches wide is pretty slim, and so I recommend that you do not rotate your canvas. Instead, just slide your ruler to the bottom edge. There, you'll make a mark every four inches. After you've completed that, you're going to make measurements along the sides of your canvas. So put your ruler at the top left side of the canvas, and you're going to make marks at 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, and 28 inches. This will create all those 4 inch squares later with two inch tall rectangles at the bottom. To make sure that your lines are straight, you have to just slide your ruler across to the right side and you'll complete those four inch increments going from top to bottom. 
you want to make sure that two inch space is once again at the bottom edge, otherwise your lines will be very crooked. After you have your measurements done, you're going to connect the vertical measurements with your yardstick or straight edge. If you're just using a small ruler, you can do that by making smaller measurements throughout the canvas. If you have a friend to help you, it makes this step go a lot easier because one person can hold the straight edge and the other person can draw the lines. But you want to draw very softly when you complete these four vertical lines. You're eventually going to erase and cover up all these lines, which is why I don't want you to press hard and make dark marks on the canvas. After you're done with your vertical lines, you're going to connect the horizontal measurements with your yardstick. Make sure that you are aligning both of those measurement marks you made earlier. Eventually, you will create 35 squares plus 5 rectangles at the bottom edge. You want to have it oriented this way so it matches your reference image perfectly. It's a really good idea to label the grid on your canvas and have it match your reference photo. You're basically creating a very artsy version of Battleship. When I did mine, I labeled the horizontal squares 1 through 5 from left to right. And then I labeled the vertical squares 1 in the top corner, moving down to 7 to the bottom full-size square, and then the bottom row of rectangles are labeled as 8. I recommend labeling your grid first before moving on to subdividing the squares because you need to make sure they are in the correct spots. So I subdivided eight of my squares to create two by two inch squares. So there's four two by two squares inside of what used to just be a four inch square. The smaller squares are in rows two, three, and four you'll really want to check your reference image to make sure that you are putting these in the correct spots. Now, these squares really help out with proportions, and I often will subdivide some of the squares even littler on very tricky parts of a portrait. So, on my example, I subdivided eight squares into even smaller one inch squares. And those are of course over the face. And I just want you to be very careful to get them in the right spots. After you finish creating your squares, you'll be able to start the drawing. To create your drawing, you're going to need the following materials. You'll need your canvas, your reference image, plus a pencil and an eraser. I know that it can be intimidating to start drawing on a new canvas, but this first step I'm going to have you take is to sketch the basic shapes in place. You don't need to worry about the details right away, and please press softly so you can erase these lines easily later. After you're done sketching, Check that everything lines up so all the sections you drew are in the correct spots. Then, gently erase all the pencil marks so you can just barely see them. After you've removed the excess graphite from your surface, you'll draw the composition using your grid. The grid will help you keep everything in proportion because you'll be able to draw everything in the right place and the right size. The grid helps you verify that everything is in the correct square. You're just changing the size of the image. You can draw one square at a time, moving from side to side, top to bottom, like a human printer, or you can draw one area at a time. For example, you could draw the face and then the hair, and then the veil, and then the background. Now I tend to draw 
in the general shapes first and add the details as I go. You'll probably notice that I will measure my reference image and also my canvas. If you do this to verify your proportions are correct, you can use your five by seven and a half inch printed image, but you'll need to multiply the measurements by four in order to increase the scale correctly. If you are drawing from a screen like I did, you can zoom in on the image until it is life size and then the squares must be exactly four inches, so you can use a one-to-one -one ratio. I'll admit that I often draw in way too many details during this step, and I end up covering everything with paint, but I see this as a practice run for me, because if I can draw it, I know that I can paint it successfully too. It's a really good idea to step back from your drawing every now and then so you can check it from a distance. Most people will see your painting from across the room or tiny on a screen, so it's important to check to see how your progress looks from a distance. I also like to mark in where the shadows will go to make putting the paint down easier in the future. I'd like to share that it took me a little less than two hours to finish this drawing, but your time will vary. The softer you draw, the easier it will be to erase the extra graphite and cover up all those pencil lines later with paint. You won't want any pencil marks showing through on your final painting. After you're done drawing and you've checked it, erase all the grid lines as best as you can. Once you've finished this step, you can plow ahead to the next part or take a break and celebrate a little bit. Finishing the drawing is a huge accomplishment. Allow me to repeat the steps of drawing on your canvas, but using still photographs instead, so you have another way to absorb this information. The first thing you'll do is lightly sketch the basic shapes onto your canvas. So using your reference image as a guide, you're going to recreate what you see square by square. But don't worry about the details. These are light, quick lines. You don't want to spend time getting details in here. You're just do an outline for the shape of the head, around the hair, outline where the veil and some of the clothes will go. You don't even need to worry about the background for this step. And you can quickly mark in where the eyes, nose, and mouth will go as well. This is just to give you a guideline so you don't accidentally draw something in the wrong square later on. After you've checked that your sketch is accurate, I encourage you to lightly erase the grid lines. You want to be able to just barely see them. By getting rid of this excess graphite, you'll reduce the chances of you getting it all over your hands when you draw and smearing everything and making a bigger mess than you intended. Once you're ready to, you're going to draw the composition. And you can approach this by doing just one box at a time moving across your canvas, or you can do different areas or parts at a time, just being careful of noticing when they switch in and out of the different squares. You're going to align each square of your reference photo with the correct squares on the canvas. So for example, square one one is in the top left corner and it's the background. You're not going to have a lot to draw there, maybe a line or two to indicate the shadows, but square three three, so three down and three across, is the middle of the face. You have eyes and a nose and those are very difficult things to draw, which is why I subdivided those squares in my example for you. So I made the boxes smaller and smaller and as long as you put your lines in the correct box, it's going to help you out. This technique is incredibly helpful if you haven't drawn a lot of portraits before, or if it's been a while since you've drawn a life-size portrait on canvas. This will just really help you out with those proportions.
after you're all done drawing, you will erase the grid lines as best as you can and get rid of those heavy pencil marks before you start painting. But before you do that, I really want to encourage you to frequently step back from your canvas and see how it looks from a distance. If you already printed your reference image, this will be a lot easier because you can hold the printed photo in one hand and step back until the reference image and your canvas appear to be the same size to you. And then you can look back and forth between the two and see if there's anything you need to correct. Once you do that and everything looks as accurate as you are going to be able to get it, make sure you take the time to get rid of those extra pencil marks. After you're all done drawing, you're going to cover up those grid lines. I have found that no matter how good of a job I thought I did erasing my grid lines, they tend to show up after I put my first layer of paint down. So to save you that headache, I'm going to show you a trick. To cover up those lines, you'll need the following materials. First, you need your palette. My palette is a piece of glass duct taped to a piece of foam core that I cut to be the exact same size. This is a very easy and affordable way to make a glass painting palette. You don't even need a new piece of glass. If you have an old picture frame on hand, you can take that glass out or even go to your local thrift store and pick up a frame for a couple bucks. If you have a different palette on hand already, you're more than welcome to use that, but glass works the best for me. You'll need your titanium white paint along with your medium. For my medium, I use Gelkid Light and a few drops of Gamasol. You need some odorless mineral spirits to clean your brushes. On the left of this photo, you can see my silicoil jar my odorless mineral spirits are getting a little dirty because I paint pretty frequently, but inside that jar, there is a metal coil and that spring prevents my paintbrush bristles from raking across the bottom of the jar where all these gross sediments acquire and it helps really keep your brushes clean. You'll want a small container to hold the medium as you're working. I have found that spaghetti sauce jars work perfectly for this. They're a really great size and then you can use the jar to hold your paint brushes when you're not using them. I use golden tacklon brushes when I paint. You only need one for this step. And I highly recommend using the Princeton Select brushes. Those are the best ones but they're expensive. And if you need a cheaper alternative, I will sometimes use the Royal and Lanical brushes. They're pretty much the Walmart knockoff of the Princeton Select. They have the same color scheme. They have similar golden tacklon bristles. They just don't last nearly as long, but they are very cheap. So if you paint a lot and blow through brushes pretty quickly, or maybe you aren't so great about cleaning them out, those are an acceptable substitute. You also need a few rags on hand. My rags are just cut up old t-shirts that I've already ruined in my painting studio. 100% cotton shirts are best, but a poly cotton blend is okay, kind of like that fabric that leggings are made out of. You just don't want to use paper towels because they break apart and those fibers get stuck in your paint and you'll be unhappy with that result. You also need to wear gloves when you paint. If you've never done this, I really encourage you to start. You've got to take care of your health. And it can be weird to wear gloves when you paint. I wear vinyl disposable gloves. If you have an allergy to that and need a different substitute, use that. It can be so weird to start wearing gloves when you paint, but after a couple weeks you will get used to it. And if you have smaller hands, I recommend going to a home improvement store or ordering the correct size. 
I found out a few years ago that if I get medium sized gloves instead of the one size fits all, I am much more comfortable when I paint. But I am really encouraging you to take care of your health when you're painting with oils. To help save time and paint, cover up the grid lines you couldn't fully erase with white paint so they don't show through when you start painting for real later. Use a thin layer of titanium white to paint over the grid lines. To mix the medium, pour a small amount of Gelkid Light and a few drops of Gamasol into a little container. Dip your clean brush in the medium and then dip that into just a little bit of white paint. You're only going to mix as much paint and medium together on your palette that you can use in one brush stroke. Cover over those grid lines. Now because I'm right-handed, I keep my palette to my right. I also wear gloves because some of the paint we'll use is toxic and it's not a great idea to get odorless mineral spirits on your skin. It is also critical to work in a well-ventilated area or wear a respirator. You need to let this completely dry like a day or two before moving on to the next step. Allow me to show you the palette view while I was covering the grid lines on my canvas. First of all, I get my palette all set up. You can see on the bottom left hand corner, I have one of my cotton rags and directly above that is my jar with the odorless mineral spirits in it. That coil is in there so I can rake the bristles of my brush across it as I clean my brushes because I have to do that a lot while I'm painting. To the right of that jar, you'll see my little marinara lid, and that's where I poured a little bit of Gelkid Light in with a few drops of Gamosol. Now, if you don't have Gamosol, you can just use some clean, new, odorless mineral spirits. It's just a couple drops. The last thing I added on my palette is on the top left corner, there's a small blob of titanium white paint. When you are painting, you want to try and only get paint on the tip of the paintbrush bristles. You don't want to dip your whole paintbrush into the paint and get it all the way up to the ferrule. That's the metal part on the handle that holds the bristles together because it is impossible to clean that out and it can contaminate your paint in the future. And speaking of paint contamination, when I am painting and when I plan on mixing paint, I will always move a small amount away from that original blob of paint. So I'm picking up just a small tiny bit of white paint with the tip of my paintbrush and I'm going to move it to a new spot on my palette. And that way I can draw from that paint without contaminating that brand new white big pile of paint I have in the top left corner of my palette. It's important to keep your brushes clean so after you do this step rinse out your brush in the odorless mineral spirits and then dry the brush with the rag. After that, just dip your brush into your medium. So I'm dipping it into my Gelkid Light. I'm going to wipe the excess medium onto the palette near the paint I just moved because I do anticipate mixing these together. So I don't need to clean my paintbrush for this because the goal is to mix the paint with the medium. So I'm going to dip my brush into that small section of the white paint. And you only combine small amounts of medium and paint as you go. Just mix what you need immediately. Do not take a whole bunch of medium and stir it in with a big blob of paint. You won't have the control you need. And then the medium does change the drying time. I've seen people do this and 
it never works out. It gets very wasteful. So only mix up small teeny amounts that you're going to use immediately. And you're just going to use this paint to cover up your grid lines. Paint really flat and smooth. You do not want these textures to show up in your subsequent layers of paint. You also want to let this paint dry fully before you do anything else. The medium does help increase the dry time, but oil paint does take a while to dry. I recommend waiting a day or two before moving on to the next step and adding more paint to your canvas. After you get all that work done, I know you're going to be tired and ready to relax, but you must wash out your brushes, especially if you are investing in some higher quality, more expensive ones. So when you wash your brushes, in addition to your dirty brushes, you'll need a sink and brush cleaner. I use the master's brush cleaner and I tend to buy these giant tubs of it because it lasts me a really long time. So first of all, you would clean out your brushes in your odorless mineral spirits and dry it off on your rag. But then when you get to the sink, rinse the brush with water and gently scrub the brush bristles into the brush cleaner. Swirl the brush around in the palm of your hand. You'll notice I am still wearing gloves and that's because I don't want to grind any of those chemicals into the skin on my hand. Rinse out your brush when you think it's clean and you're going to lather, rinse, and repeat. After you're done, you can put a really thin layer of the brush cleaner into the brush bristles, kind of like a leave-in conditioner, and then use your fingertips to shape the bristles so they go back to the shape of a brand new paintbrush. After you've cleaned up, now you can relax and Thank you so much for joining me. It's so exciting that you are going to forge one of my paintings and play this long-term practical joke on art historians and auction houses and people who collect art in the future. This video is part of a longer lesson to Forge my painting Lucrezia Claro, and this is part of the curriculum at the unaccredited College of Clare. To find the next lesson, visit patreon.com slash Claire Lockhart. So you'll find the second video of the series on patreon.com slash Claire Lockhart. Thank you so much. I can't wait to show you the next step.